There are at least three ways to build most EDH decks. Strong. Fun. And mean. <clears throat> Let's look at the strong, fun, and mean ways that I would build Aloro, Ageless Ascetic. And the video starts right now. Special thanks to our Patreon supporters who power our channel. Check out our Patreon for monthly giveaways, exclusive content, and even a starring role in our fanfight series. Link in the description below. Hello and welcome to the day. Thank you for spending your time with us. Welcome back to another episode of Jake and Joel are Magic. I am Joel. Today we're going to talk about Aloro and the three ways that I would build him in EDH. But first, if you would, go down there, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button if you like the video by the end of it. And if you want me to build a commander three ways, let me know down in the comments below and you might see it pop up in an upcoming video. Let's jump over into this command. Aloro, Ageless Ascetic. One black, one blue, one white, three other for a giant soldier for five. At the beginning of your upkeep, you gain two life. Whenever you gain life, you may pay one mana. If you do, draw a card and each opponent loses one life. And at the beginning of your upkeep, if Aloro, Ageless Ascetic is in the command zone, you gain two life. The crazy thing about Aloro is that we have an effect that we can build around that is always going to happen. Nothing can stop this effect unless something happens where like your opponents can't gain life. If one of our opponents plays something like that, that's pretty much the only thing that can shut us down. Otherwise, that bottom ability at the beginning of your upkeep, if Aloro's in the command zone, you gain two life. We can always count on that. It doesn't sound like a lot, but in MTG, if there's an effect that you can 100%, almost 100% of the time count on, then you can build a very strong deck around that. These other abilities are good too. You have an expensive commander at six, and so it hits the battlefield late and we can when we start gaining life paying mana drawing cards each opponent loses one life and we get this life drain thing going but that effect to be able to count on it out of the command zone is just nuts so that's what we're going to focus on for the strong way that i would build a loro we're going to go for a life gain life drain strategy and lean into that for the fun way that i would build a loro we are going to look for any art in any good commander cards where the character is sitting or there is a chair and we're going to build a sitting deck and for me Mean we're gonna lean into the you can't touch me aspect of the ability coming out of the command zone and we're gonna go with sort of an enchantments pillow fort strategy let's jump into the strong way Crested Sunmare, you might not think that I would start a good, strong build with a horse. However, a 5-mana five 5-5, five, five, other horses you control have indestructible, that's second ability. At the beginning of each end step, if you gained life this turn, create a 5-5 five, five white horse creature token. Guaranteed life gain is going to lead to guaranteed payoffs. We don't have to do anything to trigger cards that say whenever you gain life or if you gained life this turn, because we know that's going to happen automatically. Drug Skull Reaver is a very expensive 3-5, but it has Flying Double Strike and Life Link, and it says whenever you gain life, draw a card. This is on the battlefield, Aloro's in the command zone. We're going to gain life at the beginning of our upkeeps automatically, so we're going to be able to draw an extra card. Dawn of Hope, whenever you gain life, you can pay two if you do draw a card, plus you can create creature tokens by dumping mana into Dawn of Hope late. Well of Lost Dreams, whenever you gain life, you may pay X where X is less than or equal to the amount of life you gained. If you do, draw X cards. You see what we're doing here? We have an automatic trigger of two life gained at the beginning of each upkeep. It, again, doesn't seem like much, but it can really lead to some huge payoffs simply because we know we can count on it. Cliffhaven Vampire, four mana for a two four. We really don't care about the creature, we care about whenever you gain life, each opponent loses one life. Huge, now we're starting this drain thing going. We can double down on this. Epicure of Blood, whenever you gain life, each opponent loses one life, that's redundancy. Whenever you gain life, each opponent loses one life. Marauding Blight Priest, that's redundancy. We've got Veto, Thorn of the Dusk Rose, whenever you gain life, target opponent loses that much life. Hey yo, these are essentially enchantments in the stack. That's what we want these to be used as. Them being creatures makes them a little less sticky than an enchantment. However, redundancy on this effect is only a good thing. So let's lean all the way into it and go for our infinite combo. Sanguine Bond, whenever you gain life, target opponent loses that much life. Combine that with Exquisite Blood, whenever an opponent loses life, you gain that much life. If you can have both of these on the battlefield and something like Aloro's ability goes off and goes triggered, then you're going to be able to loop everyone's life totals down completely and win the game just like that. 
Alamoret's archive is five mana. If you would gain life, you gain twice that much life instead. There's effects like that that you can find on a lot of different cards. If you would draw a card except for the first one you draw on each of your draw steps, draw two cards instead. That's also a nice redund you know, uh, redundant effect to have on this card, but we want that first ability. If you would gain life, you gain twice that much life instead. Find some redundancy on that ability because that's going to let us run things like Aetherflux Reservoir. Whenever you cast a spell, you gain a life for each spell you've cast this turn, and you can pay 50 life to deal 50 damage to a creature or player. This can be a win con in this deck. Aetherflux Reservoir can be activated to deal 50 straight up to a player, and if they have over 50 life, God bless them. Aetherflux Reservoir won't take them out. However, most players are going to be under 50, and Aetherflux Reservoir is essentially a Death Star beam taking them out of the game. We also, if we're going to run a life gain strategy where we know life is going to be coming in, let's run Felidar Sovereign. It's another win the game condition. At the beginning of your upkeep, if you have 40 or more life, you win the game. Boom, straight up. And also, we covered all of these you win the game cards in an older video of ours, and ever since then, I've really tried to squeeze those into as many three ways as I can. Where they make sense and it definitely makes sense in this deck to run test of endurance four mana at the beginning of your upkeep if you have 50 or more life you win the game straight up i mean it doesn't get any more straightforward than that there's a lot of life gain life drain strategy in edh and this is a great deck to have it in because again you're guaranteed two life at the beginning of each turn and if you've got some cards that can really lean into whenever you gain life or if you've gained life this turn that can be a really strong effect to build around since you can almost guarantee that it's going to happen every turn. That's the strong way that I would build this deck. Let's look at the fun way and build some chairs. Let me know in the comments if you've got a good idea for the name of this deck build. Sit down, be humble, sit down, kind of a Kendrick Lamar thing, you know, take a load off, something like that. Just, oh my God, chairs. That could be a fun one. Taste the Envoy of Ghosts, chillin'. In her study, this looks like she is just planning her next victim. She knows what she has to do. She has to be the envoy of ghost. She's got protection from creatures, and she does it from her easy chair. Mangara the Diplomat. This is a diplomat study if I've ever seen one. It looks like he's in some grand hall, and he's chilling in his little throne-type chair, draped with all of the royalty fabrics that he's been given by other diplomats across the realm. Mangara sits in his chair like a Loro, ageless ascetic, and says, I'm a good EDH card too. It's just a chance I happen to be sitting in a chair so I could work for a chair-themed deck. Mangara, thank you. Greed, look at this. This is such just a classic sitting card. I love this effect. This is one of my pet cards, and it was actually one of the first cards that came to mind when I was thinking about sitting deck. Taking a load off, taking it easy. We can guarantee our effect's gonna happen. All we have to do is sit here and let the wind come to us. Ristic Study taking a load off on a little beanbag chair you know gaining some more cards having players tax themselves to keep us from drawing cards or not but regardless we're taking a load off blind obedience here are our opponents kneeling before us in our throne we are sitting on our chair and we know we're going to win eventually we're going to drain you out we're going to keep gaining life you can't stop us we've got the power of four legs not just a measly two two legs that's not enough four legs that's a good chair mother of runes sitting in her easy chair chilling in her breakfast nook she's got her morning tea she's about to sip it very slowly and watch you be drained of all of your resources, drained of all of your will to play against a Loro, ageless ascetic, as is Kambal, Consul of Allocation. He knows where the taxes are due, and the taxes are due right now. He needs your money, and he's going to do it from behind his desk, in his office, sitting down. Four legs, greater than two. Dark Confidant doesn't have to be sitting to know that he's got the power of the chair on his side. We're going to be running Dark Confidant simply because of the powerful chair that Dark Confidant chills behind. He knows he doesn't have to be sitting. The chair's going to do the work for him. That's what we're hoping with this build. Watch the Throne EDH featuring Kanye and Jay-Z. That's a good possible name for this deck. Stroke of Genius. Here's Urza chilling in his study. What did he just 
just realized chairs are great. Four legs are better than two. That's what he's thinking right here in this art. Oh my God, think of the power of four legs over two legs. I've been designing this golem all wrong. It needs four legs. Aloro agrees, Urza, and that's why you're coming along. Sir Conrad he doesn't have time to be inside, but he understands the power of four legs over two, and that's why he's sitting on his horse. It doesn't have to be a chair as long as we're sitting, as long as we're letting our opponents and the wind come to us. Throne of Bone, we've got the Western Paladin here chilling again. You know how this dude rolls. It's always sitting with this guy. He doesn't stand. Look at this. This is the second card that we have found him chilling, waiting for the victory to come to him because he knows he has set this up perfectly. Throne of the High City, how about you as the leader of this commander deck? Have your own throne right here. Pay for, sack it, you become the monarch straight up. But look at this great hall you're in. You've got some fire. You've got two big statues. You've got your throne. Now you know where you need to be chilling. Seat of the Synod. That uh, Moving on. Counterspell. Here's a counterspell where the dude is sitting and floating. He went two legs, no way. Four legs, close but not good enough. No legs. Let me know in the comments below any other sitting artwork that I missed. I know there's a lot of people chilling on horses. I want people chilling in chairs. Let me know down in the comments which chair art I forgot to put in this deck. I will humbly beg your forgiveness, and we will all embrace the power of four legs over two. That's the fun way that I would build this deck. Let's look at the mean way and go into an enchantment pillow fort. This card represents everything we want to do with this version of the deck. Five mana for an enchantment. Creatures can't attack you or a planeswalker you control unless their controller pays X for each of those creatures where X is the number of enchantments you control. We want to just continuously be dropping sticky, high power, passively strong enchantments the entire game. We're going to have payoff cards like this that really take advantage of that. And like Jake says all of the time, enchantments in EDH are some of the hardest permanents to remove. Greater Auromancy, let's make it even harder. Two mana, other enchantments you control have Shroud. Enchanted creatures you control have Shroud. They've got to remove Greater Auromancy before they can remove some of our enchantments that are actually doing stuff, that are actually winning us the game. Karmic Justice, three-man enchantment, whenever a spell or ability an opponent controls destroys a non-creature permanent you control, we're focused mostly on enchantments in this build, you may destroy target permanent that opponent controls. Y'all, that says permanent, not non-land permanent. Hint, go after their lands. That's always mean. Smothering Tithe, four mana. You know this card. You know this card. Run Smothering Tithe in an enchantment deck if you're going to be building it as a pillow fort. Luminarch Ascension, two mana at the beginning of each opponent's end step. If you didn't lose life this turn, you may put a quest counter on it. This is one of the easiest ascensions to trigger in EDH, especially if you play it early. There's not gonna be a lot of early interaction that's going to stop you from getting those quest counters fully filled out. You need four quest counters on it, and then you will be able to dump mana into it and create four four flyers until this enchantment is removed this is so powerful two mana put a four four white angel creature token with flying onto the battlefield if luminarch ascension has four or more quest counters on it this is such a house of a pillow fort enchantment hide behind your protection stuff and make a ton of four four flyers however much you've got mana for really as a win con we can play starfield of nyx you want to drop this late when you've got a ton a ton of non aura enchantments on the battlefield at the beginning of your upkeep you may return target enchantment card from your graveyard to the battlefield already huge we're already huge because this card is going to make our enchantments a little easier to kill by making them creatures so it's really nice to have this return them from the graveyard to the battlefield ability on this so that you can do that also very late some of your enchantments are going to die drop in this late this can be a game changer as long as you control five or more enchantments each other non aura enchantment you control is a creature in addition to its other types and has base and power toughness equal to its cmc so that means that if this one was counting even though it's looking at each other this would be a five five creature that would be ready to attack if an if an opponent has already been eliminated maybe two you're down to one on one or you're down to three people left dropping this and suddenly all of your enchantments can attack that can really swing a game spreading plague i love this card it's from back when i started playing five mana whenever a creature comes into play destroy all other creatures that share a color with it they can't be regenerated this is the kind of card that you want to play in a creatureless deck because it's just going to be this passive 
non-ending board wipe that opponents are going to have to play around specifically hoses monocolor decks really really strongly Mes mesa enchantress is a three mana human druid zero two whenever you play an enchantment spell draw a card you want an enchantress absolutely you do because we're going to be playing a lot of enchantments and we want to be able to keep our hand full hannah ships navigator pay three Blue and white, one other, return target artifact or enchantment card from your graveyard to your hand. This is longevity. This is the same kind of thing as Starfield of Nyx or Open the Vaults, any cards like that that are going to return your enchantments from the graveyard to the battlefield so that you can afford to lose some because you know you've got cards that are going to help you just get them back out of your graveyard and onto the battlefield. Now let's talk about a little combo that's going to be very mean and uses two enchantments, and that's Zer's Weirding and Blood Chief Ascension. Zer's Weirding says four mana, players play with their hands revealed. If a player would draw a card, he or she reveals it instead, then any other player may pay two life. If a player does, put that card into its owner's graveyard, otherwise that player draws the card. So this is giving us the option, every single time our opponents draw a card, they gotta reveal it to us and we can pay two life and they put it into their graveyard, milling it, instead of into their hand. So let's combine that with Blood Chief Ascension. At the beginning of each instep, if an opponent lost two or more life this turn, you can put a quest counter on it. Whenever a card is put into an opponent's graveyard from anywhere, if it has three or more quest counters on it, you may have that player lose two life. If you do, you gain two life. So if you've got Blood Chief Ascension activated on the battlefield, ready to go, it's got three quest counters on it, so its ability is going to be popping off. Zer's Weirding, every time an opponent draws a card, you can pay two life, put that card into their graveyard. If a card is put into an opponent's graveyard from anywhere, that player loses two and you gain two. So you go net zero life, they lose two life, and they're never able to draw a card because they're going straight into their graveyard being milled by yours truly this is a mean combo so freaking mean but in a pillow fort enchantment strategy this is the kind of thing that can create a lock on the game that your opponents aren't able to get out of if they're never able to draw a card to remove one of these two enchantments you're going to be sitting pretty that's the strong fun and mean ways that i would build a loro ageless ascetic let's close it up Thank you so much for watching. Like I said, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button if you liked the video, it really helps us out. If there's a commander you want me to build three ways, leave it in the comments. Maybe you'll see it in an upcoming video. If you want to support us further, we have a Patreon, link is down in the description below. Monthly giveaways, behind the scenes stuff, Discord access, lots of cool stuff. Go check it out, see if you're a good fit. Other than that, I'm tapped out. I'll catch you later.